Now we as cyclists and triathletes can spend hundreds, sometimes even thousands on our bikes and equipment in an attempt to make them faster. But is it actually money well spent? Well, let's look at this in a different way. Could some of those cheaper and smaller upgrades actually provide some surprising improvements? Well, today I'm gonna to be exploring a number of these products that claim to give us an aerodynamic saving and comparing them to their cost with the help of aerodynamic specialist, Simon Smart. Okay, so here's where I'm at. I've got a bunch of products around me here that you may consider when it comes to upgrading your bike, all of which are gonna claim that they save you a certain number of watts. However, this wheel obviously costs a considerable amount more than this shoe cover, for example. And okay, this wheel probably does save you more watts than this shoe cover, but how much is each of those watts saved actually costing you? Well, that is my plan today, to essentially normalize this. Obviously, there's a big difference in price between all of these products, but if we can divide the cost of the product by the watts saved, we can bring you a cost per watt figure that we can then compare between each of the products. Now, obviously, there are so many variables and factors at play here, such as the rider's weight, the rider's position, the wind speed, the bike weight, the yaw angles, so on and so forth. So this is merely a rough ballpark figure and certainly not exact science. But to bring a little bit more accuracy to the table, I'm gonna pull upon the support of Simon Smart. Now, Simon is the founder of Drag to Zero and widely recognized for his expertise in aerodynamics in the cycling world. All right, hi Simon, thanks for joining us today. Um, now I've got a, com a number of classic products here that athletes might look to when they're, they're hoping to improve the aerodynamics on the bike. Now, I do appreciate we can't pull out an accurate number of what's saved per product, but you've got over 15 years of experience in this area. So I was kind of hoping we might be able to pull upon you for some help on this. Absolutely, Mark, no problem. I can see exactly where you're coming from. Um, I think it's very confusing for the athlete and the consumer because we do get a wide range of numbers and out there and you think well, what what is true and honestly uh, it's it isn't that um you're being misled it's just there's so many different scenarios and configurations to consider so in terms of the the conditions that we we test things in in the wind tunnel and, and outside you know is that the wind angle um and the speed um and then also the configuration has a big difference so a gain of um of a, of a certain helmet on one person won't be the same on someone else Likewise, the gain of a, to a lesser extent, the gain of even a wheel in one frame is maybe different in, in another frame. So that's where there's always a variance in results and it's not black and white, I'm afraid. But absolutely, yeah, I think I've done enough, maybe too much in, in the last 15 years, spent too long, too much of my life in the wind tunnel. But I have a pretty good feeling for what the average numbers would be. No problem. Super. Okay, well... Um, we're going to test today or use numbers a day at 40 kilometers an hour because while well, you do a lot of your testing at 50 kilometers an hour and quite frankly I think a lot of athletes out there would say they don't travel at 50 kilometers an hour that often particularly not in like a long distance triathlon so I've got a number of products around me that we're going to talk through at 40 kilometers an hour and give the watt well the cost per watt each of those products now let's start with the helmet so i've got a few here i've got a an open shell helmet a, cla a, a cask uh, protoni which is very standard road helmet i've also got the cask utopia which is sort of an aero road helmet and then i have a tt helmet so a slightly longer tail with a visor on there so let's start we're going to use a baseline in each of these products um so for this obviously it is the cask protoni um a very well ventilated uh, well, road helmet. Would you like to talk through this a little bit? Absolutely. So, yeah, with a with a standard road helmet, the bottom line is the designer needs to make sure it can cool in really hot conditions, usually slow speeds at the top of mountains. So you need those big vents. Unfortunately, once you have those big vents in there um, to extract the heat, it's very difficult to keep the flow attached around the helmet. So whatever you do to the design with, with those vents, it kind of is, is what it is. It's well-ventilated, lightweight, road helmet okay so that's where let's step it up now so we've got the aero road helmets this is the utopia so in typically an aero road helmet um is going to be around uh, four watts faster than a, a normal road helmet some are better some are slightly worse and i think you get different levels of you know within it that category some are more ventilated than, than others 
Okay, so then if we step up then to a TT helmet, so we're going serious here. Uh, we've got a longer tail on the back, so this, the idea being that it sort of slots into the back and we're smoothing out that airflow over the body. Again, there's a there's a big interaction with the, the body shape, and I, I mentioned that in a minute, but typically I, I would expect to see a, a step, a gain of, of four or five watts. Sometimes on some riders, it, it could be even more. Um, what, what we find is, you know, for some smaller triathletes, actually the aero road helmets can be almost as fast as the TT helmets. And that's where there's quite a lot of confusion, I think, out there, because you do hear a lot of big numbers for people doing tests on helmets. And, and often I think they're, they're genuine numbers, but it's because of that interaction with the body shape. So that really is the one thing where you need to experiment and get the helmet that fits you. Yeah, absolutely. And I have heard of people quite often for Kona actually using a helmet like this because it is so hot and humid and they want that added ventilation. Actually, it hasn't but been much difference in what saving, etc., between these two helmets. Now, I've um, crunched some numbers using some typical costs. So it's around, we're talking somewhere in the region of £175 for an aero road helmet like this. So then this helmet comes in at around £220. And using the numbers you've sent me, that works out around £48 uh, per watt for an aero road helmet and then £25 per watt for a TT helmet, which is pretty interesting. Um, should we have a talk about wheels now? And this is a, a big area, and I know that you've got a lot of experience in having worked closely with Envy. So we are actually going to talk through a number of Envy wheels, given you've got so much data at your fingertips there. Um, so we are going to start with, as the baseline, uh, just a standard sort of 25mm rim depth wheel. Yeah, so... Um uh, to be honest, I haven't tested one of those for a very long time, but we we, we did to start with um, when we started to learn about wheels over, over 10 years ago. So, you know, fundamentally, if you think of a box section wheel, it is what it is. It's mechanically um, you know, sound, it's a structure. The performance, the aero performance of that is purely really down to the shape of the tyre, and you're always going to get early flow separation at whatever your angle. Um, so, yeah, it's just pretty draggy no there's no no if you go to buy something like that there's really no difference in any of the products in terms of aerodynamics i don't believe okay so if we step it up at the depth slightly here um let's use the mv3.4 as an example um what actually happens to the airflow then as it's as the wheel depth gets deeper or the rim depth gets deeper when you get to around a 40 a 40 mil depth rim you really start to have um, a surface there that you can start to tune the aero performance. So that's really why I think the kind of that's why the in industry is sort of settled on that as sort of being the minimum depth. And interestingly, what we found as well is is possibly the the, the depth now is more you, slightly shallower wheels are more effective now than they were ten years ago, and that's because the because of the tire shape has made a big difference to the way rim shape has gone, and the, the two have had to work in tandem and. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think in terms of gains, you could typically expect a four or five watt gain from going from your training wheel to that mid-depth carbon wheel, which has sort of become the norm, I think, for, for many people. Yeah, which is, you know, that, that's substantial in itself. And that's, I mean, crunching the numbers again. But if we use the 3.4 as an example, that works out somewhere in the region of £675 Per watt, which is which is expensive, um, but let's let's move on. So the MV seven point eight was stepping up the depth again. Um, what do we see in terms of the watt saving on a, a wheel set like that? So as you, as you um, maximise the increase the depth of the, of the rim, obviously the, the weight's going to go up. So you maybe will see a two or three hundred gram increase, which is which is a consideration. So as a course flattens out, then of course the the weight effect isn't so so important but the aero effect is more important so that's why you want to go deep the, uh, to a deeper rim on a shallower you know on, on, on a flatter course but yeah I mean, so we're talking of a similar gain in aerodynamics gain of a, another drag reduction of four or five watts so for the 7.8s they come in at a sim well the same pr price point as a 3.4 so that that equates to 338 pounds per watt but like you say um, that is still a lot of money, but there's a lot more to be gained from wheels than simply just the um, the drag or the aerodynamic gain. So, um, and then the next thing, and this is a bit of a minefield, field, it's the the disc wheel. And Envy have just brought out a disc wheel, so I know that you've got a lot of testing from that. Um, 
yeah, why would someone want a disc wheel? Are they any use? Should we get one? <laughs> What's the point? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the disc, the disc wheel again is, um, it, you can imagine it, it's very difficult to make a disc wheel very, as light as a, you know, a, a, say a 7.8 rear. So you are, there is a weight penalty, but you are maybe getting again another five or six watts. Um, at, so, so sorry, that'd be more at 50 kph, you'd probably get a gain around five or six watts. So, at the triathlon speed of 40, you're seeing a gain of two or three watts. So, you can see why, if I was you, I would be questioning whether it's the right course for this wheel. You know, if you're often below 40 kph, then you're paying for that weight and that extra inertia. Well, yeah, it also obviously gets complicated because you do need a front wheel, which is going to cost you as well. So, that is uh, it's probably quite a big. Uh, uh, a big investment for disc wheel. Now let's move on. I mean, we've spent long enough on wheels onto shoes. So again, switching down here, I've got a few options. So I've got the Shimano, I think these are the TR9. Uh, they're a very popular triathlon shoe. I've also got here um, the Bont Zero Plus shoes, which I absolutely love. Um, see a lot of pros like Jan Frodeno wearing these, pe these shoes. Um, we're also going to look at shoe covers now we've got the veloto shoe covers here that you see a lot of tt riders using i do also have here something that sebastian keenley's used which is um a more triathlon specific shoe cover so you can quickly well to a degree quickly whack this on in a transition over your shoe it doesn't come up quite as high um what are the watt savings that we'd see let's use this as the baseline obviously this is a very ventilated probably what you consider quite a messy shoe what is the difference between these types of shoes okay so yeah with shoes i mean obviously you've got the problem of um i mean that's not bad the the tri shoe in terms of shoe aerodynamics is, is already quite a good baseline um but, you know buckles and things that can trip the flow can can cost you uh, a few watts so what we're looking there for there you know if you have a smooth a nice smooth surface for the with the bomb they've done a fantastic job of cleaning everything up and they've also got some some turbulation on there with the, the dimples and things. Um, they they do test pretty well in the wind tunnel, and I would say you know typically you you'd I'd always be surprised if you didn't see a gain of two of two watts at, at forty kph with those may, maybe a bit bit more on, on on some riders from some of the tests we've done. As I say, it's quite a tricky thing to test, so you do get more variability in the numbers. So yeah, if we compare the two, so these come in at something like 170 pounds. These are 270 pounds, so another an extra 100 pounds. So that works out with a two watt saving, 135 pounds per watt, which is pretty good. Um, then, I mean, this is an interesting area, but if we use sort of these shoe covers, aero covers, um, what kind of watt saving do you see for something like this? Because these literally cost about 20 quid. <laughs> um, so what do these actually do? Are they any use? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you, again, the, the, it depends what shoe they're going on to. So if you've got really bad flow and you, you want to use a road shoe, you're going to get a bigger gain by putting that, those on because you'll help to clean up the flow to a certain extent because you're kind of bridging between the Velcro straps and things and giving you a smoother flow to, to keep, keep the blur attached around the foot. So um, I'd, I'd say, you know, the, the, certainly you can, you can get close to a, a, a bond um, with, with one of those, you know, in terms of aero performance. Okay, well, let's say one and a half watts. So that works out, say they were 20 pounds, that's around 13 pounds per watt, which is quite pretty good, actually. Um, the only issue, obviously, is getting one of these on in a triathlon. That's going to be a big issue. I guess that's where this comes in, but then this probably has even less of a saving because it doesn't come up as high, so it literally comes to literally the top of the shoe. Um, but let's say maybe about one watt. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's something to consider at least, and it's a very cheap um, aero upgrade, I'd say. Um, should we move on now to tri suits? Um, because, I mean, we've got all sorts of options here. We've got literally just wearing a cycling jersey and whacking that on in transition, a non sleeve tri suit, and then we've even got your know, most aero sort of sleeved tri suits. Um, yeah, what have you seen in terms of testing from these products? To, to, go, to go from, a, say, like a decent bib shortened jersey to a um, tri suit, potentially you could save you around 15 watts at 40 kph. You're going to be, you gain another 10 watts by sleeving the, putting sleeves on. Uh, this flow separation around the shoulders and, and the biceps is a big problem. 
and it's one of those areas that you really can reduce massively by playing with the texture of the of the material. So of course, of course, if you have that's why sleep try suits have become so popular. Either way, I think that shows that's uh, that's pretty big. So for a non-sleeve tri suit, I mean, you can pick these up for somewhere between the region of 50 to 100 pounds. So let's look at 75 pounds. That works out around 4 pounds 87 per watt. And then for a sleeved skin tri suit, um, these typically come in around 150 pounds for a good one upwards of that. So you're looking at 5 pounds 85 per watt, which is, not bad, I, that's, that's a very good uh, saving for not very much money. Um, and then let's move on to bottles now. I've just got one example here. I don't seem to have an aero bottle hanging around, but um, we've got a few options here. So let's start with a baseline of no bottle on the down tube. We've got a standard bottle on the down tube, an aero bottle on the down tube, and then bottles behind the rider. I mean, th this is a complicated area. So talk me through no bottle on the down tube to start off with? I'd say, yeah, typically uh, you can expect to see a, a, a three a three watt um, increase when you put a standard bottle on your on your down tube. Yeah, so it actually costs you three watts by actually having a bottle on there versus not having a bottle on there, the standard bottle like this, um, which is quite interesting. But obviously we all need bottles for long distance races or we need some wet means of um, storing hydration. So it's not a case of going, well, I want to save myself three watts, let's get rid of this. Uh, we do need to figure out a way around it. So let's um, look at the aero bottles then, because obviously the idea there is it is, it is more aerodynamic. It's moving out that airflow and I, I assume um, a less, less of a cost in terms of the watts. Absolutely, Mark. Yeah, the, you, with the aero bottles, they, I personally think that you can get them close to being neutral, so they're not costing you anything by carrying hydration on the down tube. Um, you know, with the right um, de uh, design of aero bottle and down tube, I'd say neutral at best. Okay. And then um, the next option, I guess, is having a bottle behind the rider. So just um, on, a, on a mount behind the saddle. Um, what sort of, well, cost would you see rather than a saving? What cost would that be on the rider? That, that's a surprising one because actually putting the bottles behind the riders can actually give you a small drag reduction because of the, the float separation. And you imagine that you've got your big left body and there's always mess behind the rider. And putting the bottle into that sort of void behind you actually can be a small I'd say, you know, I've seen maybe a two or three watt improvement in drag by having bottles behind there. Okay. It's not a practical place to have bottles, but it doesn't, it's not. Worst case, you could, I think, be fairly confident you could put it anywhere, uh, position it anywhere behind the saddle, and it's not going to cost you anything. If you're clever, you could get some small gains. Okay, cool. Well, I, I've, I've crunched numbers a little bit, because uh, let's use a standard bottle on the down tube as the baseline, because that's what a lot of people are doing um, and then using an aero bottle on the down tube is the next step up so I mean you could pick these bottles up for about five quid whereas an aero bottle might cost you around 30 pounds um, that means well cost per watt for an aero bottle is around 15 pounds per watt so we're getting around a two watt saving um, between this and an aero bottle uh, the bottles behind the rear I mean you can pick those um, systems up for around 30 to 50 pounds but as you say so that's quite interesting that actually could have a reduction further in terms of it's actually helping that airflow around the back of the rider which I hadn't realized at all so yeah I mean thanks ever so much for this today Simon that's been really interesting very thorough so thanks for that Well, that has actually been pretty amazing comparing the products alongside each other like that. A set of deep token wheels could save in the region of eight to 10 watts, but be costing you near to 330 pounds per watt. And then we've got a helmet like this, a TT or aero helmet, similar watt saving, but costing just 25 pounds per watt. And then we've got the kit, a well-fitted sleeve tri-suit that could save you 25 watts, making it just around six pounds per watt which is absolutely staggering. I mean, ultimately this has just been a bit of fun, but before you go ignoring and mocking some of these lesser and cheaper watt gains, maybe give it a little bit of a thought next time. I mean, obviously we could have 
kept going today, but I think we've probably bored you enough with some of these numbers already. I mean, there's things like the chains, the bearings, the lubes, the oversized pulley wheel systems. Maybe we'll save that one for next time, providing there's an appetite after this one. Well, I hope you have enjoyed today's video. If you have, give it a thumbs up, give it a like. Thanks ever so much to Simon Smart from Drag to Zero for his help on today's video. If you have enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more from GTN, make sure you're following us on social media and subscribed on YouTube.